All right, now quick question. How many of you are thinking right now, did I miss something? Okay, good. All right. So if you are like, hey, wait, what's going on? Now, normally we sing a few more songs in the opening part and then the message. Well, today we are going to worship more, all right? But what we did is we kind of flip-flopped our order of service. Uh, because of what we're talking today in the message, I just felt like I wanted to mix it up a little bit. And I felt like the Lord was saying, you know, sometimes worship prepares us for the word. And I just felt like today the word was going to prepare us for worship. So we are definitely going to sing some more here in a few minutes. But wanted to, yeah, just jump right into the message here. Uh, if uh, you would just grab your Bibles right now and turn to John chapter 17. Uh, that's where we're going to be today. You can pull everything up electronically on the Version Bible app. Uh, if you're here on site, we have the paper notes in the back. You can grab those as well. But we are in week number nine of our uh, message series, Gospel of John, where the last nine Sundays we've been going through this Gospel of John chapter by chapter. And many of us are going through the Gospel of John study guide uh, and meeting in small groups throughout the week. And with it being week nine, I just want to encourage our church to finish strong. Many times when we get towards the end of a small group session, it's kind of easy just to um, maybe not finish out. But I just want to encourage you, man, finish strong. If you're in that workbook, keep finishing it out and in a small group. Uh, keep meeting with your group those last couple weeks. It's going to benefit everybody. Um, but today I want to bring you a message called this. It's called Being the Answer to Jesus' Prayers. Being the answer to Jesus' prayers. Did you know that right before Jesus went to the cross that he prayed for you? That's what we're going to read about today in John 17. Uh, did you also know that he is now, he's still praying for you. He's still praying for us um, all the time. And that is just so encouraging. We see that in Romans chapter 8 where it says Christ Jesus is at the right hand of of God interceding for us. And that's not a past tense. That's not written in past tense. That's present tense. It says Jesus is still at the right hand of God praying for us. And I just think that is so awesome that our God loves us so much that he is doing that. So today, the message is this. We're going to look at three ways in John 17 that Jesus did pray for us and then how he still does pray for us. And here's the three ways. Just give them to you up front. Um, we are the answer to Jesus' prayers when, one, we know him more, two, when we are set apart, and three, when we contend for unity. So that's where we're going to be today. Let's just pause and say a prayer that uh, God would just speak to us through this message today and prepare our hearts for going back into worship. So God, thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you that we can gather as a congregation, as church family on-site, online, Lord, just to get into your presence. Lord, get into the word of God and, and, and grow in our faith and know you more, God. So I just pray you'd use today, Lord, use these words out of your word, God, to, to just transform our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. All right, so let's just follow along together in John 17, starting at verse 1. Let's talk about this. It says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you. Notice that. Jesus was praying, church, that we would know God, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So church, number one, how can we be the answer to Jesus' prayer? If you're taking notes, write this down. The first way is if I know God more. Knowing God more and more. Now, it's not that we're knowing about God, but we're knowing God in a relational way, in a very personal way. 
When Jesus said in verse 3 of uh, chapter 17, he says, that they may know you. That word know is not just a head knowledge know. It, it's, a, it's a very intimate knowing of somebody. And so when Jesus was praying for us that we would know God more, it wasn't that we would just know more about him, more facts about him, more historical knowledge, more academia. It's not about knowing more about God, but it's knowing God more. And that was Jesus' prayer for us. And he uses this word in this text, and it's the word glorify. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't use that word glorify very often. In fact, we hear it seldomly kind of in our culture when somebody wants to use it in this kind of context. They might say, oh, that's just a glorified, you know, something. You know, someone's just trying to make, you know, elaborate or exaggerate on something and and they use that word, but what's the context of Jesus using this word when he, he said that he wanted God to be glorified? Well, it all has to do with knowing God more. When Jesus was praying for us, that he said, Father, I pray that your children would know you more. And he uses this word glorify. What does that even mean to glorify God? Well, it means to magnify and that, that kind of, we kind of know what magnify means, right? Magnify means what? To make something bigger. When I was growing up, my parents had this drawer. We kind of called it the junk drawer. There was this, like miscellaneous stuff in there. Well, my mom and dad used to keep this magnifying glass in this drawer. And, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have these, all right? I could see a little better. But um, I noticed that sometimes my mom and dad would go in this, this drawer and grab the magnifying glass and kind of like, Try to read something. I'd just be looking at him like, that's, that's kind of weird, but okay. But then I really loved when I would play with the magnifying glass because I'm like, this is cool. Like, and you'd make like little ants bigger and make little things bigger. And I'm like, this is such a cool toy, right? And, but magnify means to make something bigger. Guys, what does that have to do with knowing God more? Okay, let's have some fun. Ready? If everybody could just take a hand out and make like a C. Go ahead, get your hand out, make a C, all right? Now, I want your pointer finger, I want you to put your pointer finger about the top of my head. Go ahead, so you're kind of measuring me out. So put your top finger at the top of my head. Now, now put your thumb where my feet are, okay? And I, I want you to measure how big I am. Go, go ahead, measure how big I am. Now, as I'm looking out, I am not very big, okay? Okay? You guys are saying I'm about this big, right? Well, so are you. <laughs> anyways, but um, anyways, I just think this is so interesting that from a distance, how big am I? I'm only this big, and, and you're that big too. But guess what? As we would get closer to each other, what would happen? Well, your fingers would start to spread out until they couldn't spread anymore. And as you get bigger, you probably have to use two hands. And wow, Mark, you're this big now. Oh, wow, Mark, you're this big. Until we were really close, right? And when we're really close, then you say, wow, you've been magnified. You've been made bigger. And guess what happens when somebody becomes magnified in your life? Yes, you get to see the flaws. Uh, yes, I get that. We get to see all the flaws, but Jesus doesn't have any flaws, right? So, but we also get to see the good things. Like when we get closer to somebody, we get to know them more. And that's how it is with Jesus. See, right now, sometimes, you know, when we look at Jesus, Jesus is about this big to us. Why? Because, because we're not as close as we could be. And, and, and Jesus was praying, God, I just pray that your children would know you more. How? By glorifying, or Jesus used the word glorify to magnify, which he was saying, I want, I want my children to, to become closer so God is magnified, so we can see all the goodness in him. Church, sometimes when we're at a distance from God, we don't really get to see all his goodness. But it's when we get closer and closer and closer to God that we realize, oh my gosh, you know what? When I, went in, when I was going through that trial, now I see how God was there for me. You know what? When I was going through this really hard time, I thought that I was walking all alone. But you know what? Now I see that even though there was, yeah, one set of footprints in the sand, I do now see that God was carrying me the whole time. You see what I'm saying? 
And that does not happen unless we go from this God to making God real big. How does that happen? By becoming closer. And the closer we get to God, guess what? We get to know him more. And so the Bible talks about this, that um, in Titus 1.16, it actually says people claim they know God. So people are saying this. People are claiming that God is like this, that they're really close. People are claiming they know God, have that intimate relationship, but they deny him by the way they live. Okay? So sometimes we see us or other believers or other people would say, yeah, I know God. I know God. But, like, our lives don't look like that. Maybe our attitudes, the way we treat people, you know, things that we're doing, it doesn't line up with us having that intimate relationship with God because of this. How many of you know the closer I get to God and I get to see God's goodness, what would my response be to that? Oh my gosh, God, you love me. Oh my gosh, God, you are there. God, you never leave me. You know what my response is when I get so close to God that I see his goodness? I just want to give my life to him and live for him. Amen? See, but sometimes we claim to know God, but we're not living for him. We don't have that intimate relationship with him. And so what God is saying is Jesus was praying, Oh God, Father, my prayer is that your sons and daughters, your people would know you more. Church, how does that happen? By making God big. How do we make God big? By coming closer, right? The Bible says in James 4, 8, it says, Come close to God And God will come close to you. Man, the closer we get to God, the bigger he is, the more we see his goodness. And our response is to live for him. You know, there's a story in the Gospels that really illustrates this. It's The name of the the story is called um, the the woman who lived a sinful life. Doesn't really um, identify her much other than that. Because, but what she did is so amazing. See, Jesus was eating dinner at a Pharisee's house, and this woman who had lived a sinful life in the village, she heard that Jesus was at this house. So, so it was kind of like this. Like, how far was she from Jesus? She was pretty far. She was like this. Jesus was only this big. But you know what? She wanted to know him more. And the only way she knew that she could know Jesus more was instead of this, how big are you, Jesus? No, it's to come close to Jesus. So she finds out that Jesus is having dinner at this Pharisee's house. And so she goes there. She wasn't even invited. She just goes there. And so Jesus is eating with this Pharisee and some other people. And the Bible says that this lady, she just goes up to him and begins to weep because of her life being broken And she feels like she finally has found the answer to her life. And so she's breaking down and she's crying. And it says her tears hit Jesus' feet. And then she dries Jesus' feet with her hair. And then it says she kisses his feet and pours perfume on his feet. Well, this enraged the Pharisee. Because how dare some sinful woman come in and do that to Jesus. And he's thinking this. So I love Jesus. He just turns to this Pharisee and says, a man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. And then Jesus says this, hey, who do you suppose loved him more? Who who do you think is going to love Jesus more? The guy that got 500 Uh, debt paid or 50 debt paid? Well, Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. And then Jesus says this, I tell you, her sins, and yes, they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. 
Church, you get the difference? Like, there's the Pharisee who claims they know God, but when the Pharisee was measuring up Jesus, Jesus was only about this big. Why? Because the Pharisee was so far away. But the woman came close, and Jesus was this big, but she came close, and now Jesus is bigger, and she gets to see who Jesus really is, his goodness and his love for her. And because of that, she just responds to him with giving Jesus her love and her, and her life. Isn't that cool? So when Jesus was praying for us in the garden and as he's praying for us today, do you know what Jesus is praying for you and me? Jesus is praying that we would know him more. Not just up here more, but right here more. That he would become bigger, magnified. I get to see who he really is. And man, I'm going to respond by giving him my life. That's his prayer for us. Let's look at the second one. Go back to John 17, verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. You knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer and they are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Talking about Judas. Verse 13. I am coming to you now, Jesus said, but I say these things while I'm still here on the world so that they may have the full measure of joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am the world. Now here's the prayer Jesus prayed over us. My prayer is not that you take them, watch this, Jesus did not pray that we would be taken out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one while we're still in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So let me give you the second way that we can be the answer to Jesus' prayer. The first one is that I know God more, but the second one is this. I can be the answer to Jesus' prayer if I'm set apart. If I'm set apart. Church, what does that mean? It, means? it means that while I'm in the world, I don't become like the world, but while I'm in the world, I can still be set apart, that I'm, I still belong to Jesus, but while I'm in the world, I can influence the world for Christ. That's what Jesus' prayer was for us. And he uses this word, sanctify. What does that mean? Well, just like we don't use the word glorify a whole lot, which means to make God bigger, what does this word sanctify mean? The word sanctify means that we would be set apart. It does not mean separate. Watch this. Many times we as believers, we have this kind of wish that, oh God, it's so bad out in the world. Oh God, it's so evil out in the world. There's so much hard things out in the world. Would you just kind of beam me up, Scotty, out of the world? Get me out of this place. Right? Right? And did you notice Jesus' prayer was not that? Jesus did not pray to God that we would be taken out of the world. He goes, no, they're going to be in this world until the time comes that the church is taken up. But until then, we are still in the world, but we're called to be sanctified in the world or set apart. I mean, we're, we're not separated. We're in the world. We're just not like the world. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus' prayer was for us. That we don't separate ourselves. We still live in the world, but while we're living in the world, we live for God and he protects us and gives us joy. Let me share a couple verses about this. Romans 12, 2, pretty familiar verse. Romans 12, 2, but let's read it in this context today. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. So if we're Christians, if you're a Christ follower, the Bible says don't copy the customs and behavior of those in the world. Even though you're in the world. You're in the world, but don't copy. Don't, you're in the world, just don't be of it. Don't copy the world. 
be sanctified or set apart, or how Romans 12 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So church, it all begins by the way we think, that I have to be thinking as a believer. That's why Jesus was praying for us, because it's kind of hard sometimes, right? But Jesus was praying for us that, oh God, while your people are still in the world, may they change the way they think, that they're not to be of the world, like, like the world, copying the behaviors and customs of the world, but we're called to be influencers in the world for Christ, right? Just like Jesus said in Matthew 5, he says, you, he's talking to us, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, watch this. Let your light shine, the light you have for Christ. Let it shine before others that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what Jesus was saying was, he's like, while you're in the world, don't put, don't put your light covered. How many of you guys grew up in Sunday school and you sang that song, right? Hide it under a bushel, no? Right? Anybody sing, raise your hand if you sang that song in Sunday school, right? Okay. He's this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Okay. So that's what Jesus is saying. He goes, while you're in the world, don't, don't cover that you're a Christ follower. You're in the world, but let it shine, man. Let it shine. Be an influencer. How do we do that effectively? The Holy Spirit. Look at this in John 20. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, why, why were the disciples all together in a room with the doors locked? Because of fear of the Jewish leaders. But Jesus came and stood among them and said, guys, you're all together in this room quaking with fear. Jesus comes in, he goes, peace, man, you don't have to live with fear. Peace, I, I'm with you. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Now watch this, I love this. It says, as the Father has sent me, I am still sending you. I think that is so, so important that we get here today, church. Listen to this. When Jesus came into the room with all his main disciples quaking in fear, he did not say this. He goes, oh, you poor Bless your heart. Poor, you're afraid. Oh, you, you stay here. You don't have to go out there in that world. No, no, no. You just stay right here. Bless your little heart. Bless your heart. Jesus did not say that, church. His disciples were in this room quaking with fear. Jesus dies on a cross, is buried in a tomb, raises again with resurrection power, comes in the room where his disciples are, and he, he doesn't say, oh, poor you. He goes, hey, guys, in, in case you forgot, as the Father has sent me, I'm still sending you. Can you imagine what they were thinking? Darn. I thought we were going to get a pass on this one because I'm afraid. <clears throat> Jesus said, no, no, no. I, and then, you know, Jesus like, listen, guys, I know you're afraid. I know you have anxiety. I know you have stuff, okay? But I'm still sending you. And church, that's a word for us today. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you feel is this hindrance, if you have fear and anxiety, yeah, join the club. We all have fear and anxiety, right, over something. We all have stuff that's like, I don't know about that. It tries to steal my peace and steal my joy. Yeah, we all have something like that. But Jesus doesn't come in and he goes, okay, you get a pass then. You get a pass. No, he goes, no, 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 no. You're still living and breathing on this earth because I have a plan and purpose for you and you're still here. Guess what? As the Father has sent me, I'm still sending you. I'm not giving up on you. But then here's the whole key, the next part of the verse. And with that... He breathed on them and said, receive who? Yeah, see, that's, that's where it's at. See, Jesus said, yeah, I know you have fear. I know you have stuff. I know you have things going on. But it's all when we are walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit in us and through us. The Bible says in Acts, he goes, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
to be my witnesses. So yeah, I know you have some stuff that's going to hold you back, but I, I'm still sending you. The answer is be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wonder in the average congregation, in the average, in the United States, just, let's just take the average congregation in the United States, okay? If you take all the believers in that average congregation, I wonder how many people that have accepted Jesus Christ in their life have asked Jesus to say, Jesus, now that I've asked you to come into my life and I know your Holy Spirit dwells on me, would you now fill me with your Holy Spirit? I wonder. I wonder. Well, you know what? We don't have to wonder anymore, church. If you know Jesus Christ and you've asked Christ in your life, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. But you know what? Jesus teaches us that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we can be the light to the world so that we can be his witnesses, so that we can do what he's calling us to do with confidence and strength. Amen? Amen. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, let's, let's just have, take a clap break. That's cool. Thank you, Lord. Okay, the third thing that Jesus prayed, John 17, 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be what? One. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be, here it is again, one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to what? Complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. All right, so we're the answer to Jesus' prayer when we know God more, by what? Making him big and seeing him who he really is and loving him more. By being set apart, we're in the world, not of it, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And lastly, if I contend for unity, if I contend for unity, that I'm not just hating people, I'm not just tolerating people, but I'm really loving people. See, the word unity or to unify means to be in oneness. We heard Jesus say that a number of times. God wants us to be one as he is one. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one in perfect unity. And that's how God wants us. That's what he was praying for for us. And you know, there's a verse in Romans that it says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Um, some of you might know what harmony is, uh, but not everyone may know uh, the musical terms. But the word harmony means that not all the notes are the same, but you have three different notes that when you play them individually, they are very different. But when you play them together in unity, it's, it's in harmony. It's beautiful. Okay. Oh, perfect timing. Chloe, would you give me the individual notes of a D chord? There you go. So three notes. Did you notice how they were all different? Do, can you do that again, Chloe? Three different notes. Now, Chloe, play them together. See that? That's harmony. That's when three different things contending for unity, being together, sound beautiful. Church, can I say that's what Jesus was praying for us? Okay, how many of you know we're all different, right? We're all different. But Jesus is calling us, as we're all different, to come together. Not be individual notes, but come together in harmony. Do you know what stops us from being in harmony? Pride. It says, do not be proud. Pride is when we think we're better than that other person who's different. Let's not let that happen. Jesus was praying that we'd be in unity. Look at this next verse in Colossians. It says, And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's real love. When even though we're different, we 
are going to still love one another. And look at this last verse I want to share with you today. Ephesians 4.13 says, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be what? Can you say this word with me? Mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Did you know that unity, when we're contending for unity, it's a sign of our, of our spiritual maturity? That the more we're maturing in Christ, the more we're growing in Christ, the more unity that we are going to contend for, the more love we're going to show. And hey, we all start off as baby Christians. When we accept Christ, we're all like infants in Christ. But we're called to grow and mature. And one of the evidences of that is when we are contending for unity. Oh, you think different than me? That's okay. We can still be together. We can still be that cord, right? That's beautiful. And that's what Jesus was praying. Church, we can be the answer to Jesus' prayer when we say, I want to know God more. I want to magnify. I want him to be bigger. As I get closer to him, he's going to be bigger, and I'm going to see him for who he really is, and I'm going to just fall in love with him more and more. I want to know him more. I want to be set apart. I'm in this world, but I'm called to be an influencer in this world for him, and I need the Holy Spirit, fullness to do that. And also, I want to contend for unity, love, loving people. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word to us today. Thank you that we have the opportunity to be the answer to your prayer. What a privilege and honor it is. And God, I just pray that as we go into this time of worship, Lord God, that we would just experience your presence in a genuine, real way. In your name, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If there's anybody here today and you've never invited Jesus in your life to be your Savior, man, today's the day. Man, just invite him in. Say, Jesus, I've been living apart from you, and I want, I'm just asking you to come into my life and save me and be the Lord of my life. I want to live for you all my days. Forgive me my sins. I recognize what you did on the cross was for me. And I ask you to come into my life in your name your name, Lord. Amen. Well, church, if you could just stay seated for a minute and just look up here. Church, here's what we're going to do. So we have plenty of time. We have several minutes. This was all how we thought that Jesus planned for us today. Today, we want to respond to this message. We want to get closer to God. Let's, as we're singing these songs, I just want to let you know, you can stay seated if you want. You can stand up. You can come to the altar and just spend time with the Lord at the altar. But just spend time with Jesus today, singing these songs, letting him just have your heart. We're going to ask our prayer teams to be available on the sides of the sanctuary. If you would like us to pray for anything, please don't don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Don't hesitate. You can just get right out of your seat and just go meet one of our, one of our prayer teams. We'd love to pray with you in these next few minutes together. Okay? So let's do that. Let's just continue to worship him. Thank you, Lord.